So like a great presenter once said, the uh, clock is already started, so I can start. <laughs> Welcome. This is SciOps, and data scientists need DevOps too. But I want to talk up first about what happens when a, an ID is born. We have a brilliant scientist. She comes up with a great idea. She wants to make the world a little bit better. She will implement it in a notebook, test it, run it, maybe show it to her colleagues, draw graphs. But then she's a good scientist, she's a talented one, so she wraps it up as a Python model. model. Uh, this model can be run, can be executed, can be installed. But then an engineer has to re-implement this model as a service. So more work, blocking our brilliant scientists. And once the sensible engineer created this service, well, they need the help of a DevOps person, SRE, in order to actually deploy it, put it in production. They throw it over the wall, the responsible SRE finds this tired service, is way overworked, and, well, it breeds life into the service. It's a bit too late, and people don't really use the service because it's too late. It's not super useful. Sounds familiar? Right. Is there a better way? I think there is. Oops. Brilliant scientist comes up with an idea. Brilliant scientist will then turn it into a service and it's deployed. People can use it and the world is a little bit better. So how, do how can we do this? I think data scientists should have full control over the implementation and also full responsibility. This marks a Whoa. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Mm. So this marks a move to useful solution from just brilliant ideas. Everyone has an idea, not everyone can make it useful. How do we do this? First, let's talk about frustrations. Because they are shared among the team. Engineers don't like waiting, but nobody likes waiting anyway. Everybody likes to innovate. They want to have the time to do that. And everybody hates repeating themselves. I think it's shared for everybody. Nobody likes contact switching or they want to have impact on the product. And of course, it's very important to be effective as well. But the priorities are not shared. And this can drive some conflict. Whoa. Should you stop using this? Engineers care about performance. Data scientists care about algorithms. And maybe DevOps people care about monitoring or something else. Maybe about open source, or they want to import everything on it has to be really scalable. I don't know many data scientists that really care about scalability, um, especially in their starting years. So, we have Asaf. It's a simple model serving platform that provides a single library import that can turn any function into a high performance server. This is good because it gives the scientists control over their actions and over the things they produce and hopefully will help facilitate DevOps culture. So, staff infrastructure and Kubernetes uh, on a glance. We have users, we have uh, centralized services, um, caching, we have a collector and all sorts of other plugins. Uh, this collector will move messages to request queues, which then the connectors will pull those messages and pass them to the models. This means that the scientists can concentrate on only implementing the things they care about and just pass this function to that library and they get a high performance server, which is pretty nice. Importantly, this should help implement something I would like to call um, Darwinian uh, debugging or Darwinian um, production. Because if the service is live, it means people can use it. If people can use it, they, they will find shortcomings or 
things to improve or things that, that it is good at. And then we have an indication that we should put more work into this service. It's a proof. It's a data-driven proof that people actually use it and we should put more effort into it. So with the message queues, we have a request queue. Messages are picked up by the connector on the designated process, that is the model usually. Once the model calculates, it can return the response back to the response queue. This is being implemented on RabbitMQ. So the main benefit of using this in this way, which adds complexity, of course, it's the coupling of the producers and the cons consumers. Scientists are consumers. They consume messages from the outside, then they process them. But it also assures resilient communication compared to the flimsy implementation that um, an overworked engineer would do for a normal um, data science model that is not proven to be important. So the most important uh, central service is the ASAF HTTP server. It's a high performance collector. It's instrumented for tracing and uh, Kubernetes gives us the monitoring. The benefit is that we change once and we enjoy everywhere. One more thing about uh, connectors is that it's important to use message, passage, message passing for concurrency. We don't want people that don't care about performance or that are not experts in these things to touch them or we, do, we don't want them to shoot, shoot themselves in the foot. This way, this decoupling will uh, ensure only experts will work on the performance part and only experts will work on the science parts or the algorithmic parts. This is the anatomy of an ASAF connector. So pulls messages from RabbitMQ. These requests are passed to the ASAF connector and the ASAF connector will move this message to the predict. Pulling the messages are async, processing the messages is sync, and this is the way we can implement embarrassingly parallel applications. You write procedural, it runs in parallel. It has high availability out of the box and basically infinite horizontal scaling, especially when using Kubernetes. Um, in production, we do it all the time. We have uh, an automatic pod group. They grow and they scale up and down automatically when needed. Let's see it in action. So I'll start the ASAF server and I'll also start the model. The model is a movie recommendation system. Let's take a look. Visible? Right. So we have the train function. Uh, it just loads a file. And I implemented this uh, carrot function so we can just push they get predict into start. Start is this single library import that I promised. So it's just the predict um, function that is being provided by scikit-learn or surprise uh, in, this case, in this case. Let's see it in action. So that was pretty quick. Um, this move recommendation system is based on this training uh, training set. We have a bridge over the river Kwai. We have uh, when Harry met Sally, and we know that a user didn't like the movie Akira. It's like a manga, kind of violent. So we ask, will the user like um, when Harry met Sally? And the answer is, well, kinda. It has a 3.89 out of five. Pretty good. Pretty good fit, maybe we should. This is the demo, and it's I, I wanted to show how easy it is to move from a data science model into a server. Oops. All right, so 
continuous integration and continuous deployment for data science model. Using a SAF, we can implement that. So we have our scientists, we have our engineers. They push changes to GitHub. These changes are being picked up by drone or bit server. Tests are being run, which means scientists now write tests, right? They have access to the build server. They look at the builds. If the build fails, they have to fix it. And they know how to fix it because it's only their code. There's no uh, mixing of concerns. They know their code best. They should, they are the ones that should fix it. The same for the engineers. Pushing changes to the SAF code base will propagate to all the models, making sure the engineers spend their time on the right thing, not on repetitive tasks. This means we can do triage. Responsibilities are especially obvious, right? A pod will only contain code that is relevant for this group or team or person. So bugs are fixed by the implementers and everybody are writing tests. A short anecdote that uh, happened in our company a few weeks ago. Um, we saw bugs coming in. We saw errors uh, increasing. And there was a discussion between an engineer and a scientist on what to do. Now, the obvious easy th uh, thing was to add this if on the client, and you know that kind of worked. <coughs> but what we managed to do using a SAF is to show the scientists that the best solution would actually to improve their own model to support this uh, corner case. So they got they got better, they solved the corner case. They also know a bit more about engineering and the engineer was free to s spend her time on more important things that only she can actually solve. So we provide some boilerplate because we don't want the scientists to learn too much about things they don't care about. This is very important. So we have base repository. We have the base Python module structure. It's this init kind of thing. Uh, we have a Docker file, so the scientists do have to know a, a bit about using Docker files. Um, I will show it very soon, but they have to know the name of their application, for example. Then in the build file, just a few more changes. They have to point to the correct repository, and then the deployment file just picks up all of these changes. So they do need to cross the boundaries a little bit, but not too much. Hopefully, complexity is controlled. So it looks something like this. The top part is the build file. We define the image we uh, push to, the app name, stuff like that. Then the picture in the middle is from uh, a QBML file. So it just picks up all the variables. And the one on the bottom is the Docker file. So we have a uh, Vondekin data team base that um, has the SAF dependency installed. And we add the app and run it. We can see that the start file name is an argument. So this file is kind of generic. So, what improvements did we deliver? We have a centralized application, which means we do once, enjoy everywhere. We have continuous deployment for data scientists. We have the, um, some of the scientists have families, and they are confident, co confident enough to push the production even at, uh, right before they have to pick up their kids. It works really well, and responsibility is shared um, equally. And because the library is very easy to use, they didn't actually have to change too much the way they work. So we ship the cohesive process for shipping to production. It doesn't matter if you're a scientist or engineer or any, anyone else. You have to know a minimum set of requirements. And once you do, you can start contributing to the production and the revenue of the company. This was short and sweet. 
you can check out the Asaf platform. We are using it in production. It's, uh, it's from the last uh, pull request. It got much, much, much better. It's uh, very reliable. Uh, and I would love uh, contributions. If you like the art, you can follow the artist. And I guess we have time for questions if there are any. Mm. Oh. Excellent question. But first, I showed the Jaeger UI. I promised it was instrumented. It is. We can look at one of the requests. We can see its length. It took um, a bit over five milliseconds, almost six. And we see not a lot of time was passed in the model itself. We can see the um, options that were passed to it. And we can also see the response. So I think this is pretty special. For any service that is deployed to Asaf, this is automatically provided. No need to instrument anything. So we get a pretty good triages. Now, how do I test machine learning models? It really depends. Um, for unit tests, you will only test the, the simple units, right? Not actually the output statistics. That's decoupled from a SAF. Biggest difference between a SAF and TensorFlow for Thank you for this question. Excellent question. Um, TensorFlow doesn't really support um, Python in the way that scientists actually use it. Um, it's much harder to use, and it's focused on um, more complicated models than simple scikit-learn or um, interactive models like that. Um, TensorFlow serving is great, it's high performance, and we plan on creating a connector for TensorFlow, which will combine the A's of using ASAF with the major performance and um, algorithm and everything that the TensorFlow can um, provide. How do you deal with scalability of connected clients? Do you mean fast producer, slow consumer? Who asked this? I don't really understand the question. I'll guess. It's <laughs> um, fast producer, slow consu consumer. So um, currently, Asaf has a hard coded timeout of one minute. So you need to put back pressure somewhere. You can't have people just attacking all the, I mean, your microservices. If it takes 50 seconds to calculate something, then it takes 50 seconds to calculate, and that's, that's how long it's going to take. You can horizontally scale to a reason. But that's a good, I think it's a good time to talk about uh, this Darwinistic process, because we actually this actually happened. So, we had the service deployed. This service was um, computing something in uh, natural language processing and it took like almost a minute to return. We deployed that this way. We didn't have uh, too many users for that, so it wasn't very dangerous. But the more um, people used it, the more people in the company realized it's useful. And then we, it was a proof for the scientists to put more time into this service, which made it faster. And now it actually returns in like uh, under a second. That was pretty nice. What background is required, is required to become data scientists? I love this question. Uh, uh, first, I think you need to have an interesting life. For a data scientist, for an engineer, if you want to work in IT and be very productive, you need to have an interesting life. You need to want to deliver, and you need to have this hustle. Background? Depends what you want to do. Maybe you need linguistics background. Maybe you need statistics background. You probably need statistical background. But should it be um, Bayesian statistics? Maybe. I don't know. Anything else? If not, thank you very much. 
I really enjoyed myself for a great audience.